Um, welcome to the Modern HTTP uh, Architecture Talk. Um, I am doing this without my notes at all. Um, this is two times I've given this talk, and both times my uh, note server has not worked. So I'm trying to be all modern semantic web and using HTML slides, and I feel like I should be back in the proprietary uh, world just using Keynote. Um, a couple of things of house cleaning, uh, housekeeping before we start. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, throw your hand up and ask them during the talk. Um, if we have time afterwards, we'll do a, a more formal Q&A. Um, but I like these talks to be uh, interactive, so I don't want to just get up here and talk for uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes straight. So if you have questions about something particular, uh, feel free to, to uh, interrupt. Um, if you're using Twitter, uh, if you'd use the mod HTTP hashtag, um, that way I can go back and find them. Um, and if you want uh, to uh, include me in the, the comment or question as well, you can use this as a way to do async questions. Um, if everybody's really shy afterwards and there's no questions, we'll pull up Twitter and start seeing what people uh, tweeted. Um, all these slides are online. Um, and it, like I said, this is just HTML, so my notes are actually in the source code. Um, don't worry about uh, trying to take notes for links and things like that. Uh, you'll see some yellow text throughout. Those are all things you can click on. Uh, so if you see something, a, a tool or a particular uh, topic, uh, it's like, well, where's the, the URL for that? It's actually embedded in the document. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm uh, Travis Swicegood. I uh, am the director of technology at the Texas Tribune. Uh, we are an online politics and policy paper uh, that was born digital about uh, three and a half years ago that covers the state of Texas. Um, the, the architecture that I'm describing here is not where we're at, it's where we're headed. Um, so don't think that I'm up here uh, up on the mountaintop looking down at everybody saying, hey, this is what you guys should be doing, um, because it's definitely uh, an ever-evolving process and something that we're working towards, not something that we have. Um, so I want to kind of set some expectations about what we're going to cover. Um, this talk is uh, about the web and uh, HTTP. Um, those can almost be inter uh, interchanged at this point. Um, the keynote this morning did a really good job of talking about sort of the mobile web versus the web. Um, those are quickly becoming the same thing. When you talk about HTTP, you're almost talking about the web now, and that's just the transport layer uh, that you're dealing with on that. Um, this talk is also mostly theory. Um, there's no, this isn't a cookbook. There's not, a, not something particular you're going to be able to say, okay, I use this tool and I do this thing just like that. Uh, I'll be able to walk away and, and do something. This talk sits at a le uh, level above that, and it's sort of use the tools that you have that, that work for you to try to figure out how to make all this work together. Um, so it, it's applicable regardless of what framework you're using, regardless of what language you're using, um, or, or how you're approaching uh, your server-side uh, infrastructure. So I want to talk a bit about the traditional infrastructure. Um, a traditional, like the very, the most simple, most naive way you could do a, a web infrastructure is you have one application server that's responding back with HTML of some sort that's that's doing whatever it is that your big application does. Uh, somebody makes a request, goes through the internet, gets routed to the server, that server uh, does something. Um, this, has, this is really easy to understand and it's really approachable, especially when you're first starting out. Um, it's also something uh, that doesn't actually uh, scale very well because the application server that you have is, is sitting there and as soon as a request comes in, it's busy working on uh, handling that response or generating that response, and all other requests just start to bottleneck back up. Um, the way you would generally fix that is throw a reverse proxy in front of it and start fanning out the number of uh, um, application servers. In the PHP world, this is done for us, and it's one of those things we don't necessarily think about because of the way Apache works and, and mod PHP's integration into Apache. Um, you would go in and it handles having all of the workers behind it that are basically all of your individual application servers that can pick up and run a piece of PHP and, and generate that response. Um, so it's one of those things you don't generally have to think about. If you're working at something like Ruby uh, and using Rails back in the old days when you were still using the Rails server, this was something you were keenly aware of because you had one process or maybe a couple of processes that you're constantly having to restart because of all the memory leaks and things like that. Um, if you're trying to do Django code in Python and use their development uh, server, which I've seen people do, 
uh, you're going to have the same problem. They're not meant for production. Um, the benefits of this uh, style um, is it's really, really easy to scale. Um, this is probably the biggest benefit. You figure out how many application servers you need, uh, or how many clients you can deal with per application server. Um, so let's say you can deal with 100 uh, users per server. Um, you need to bring in, uh, to double that, you bring it up to two. To make it 10x, you bring up 10 more. Uh, it's really easy to figure out uh, what's going on with it um, and approach it. Um, it's very, very predictable. Um, once you scale, and I'm kind of glossing over things like the database, because that's another choke point that you could have in that. But assuming every single application server you bring up is completely self-contained and can handle n number of users, you just, every new server you bring on, that's n more uh, new users that you can deal with. Um, so if this is easy and people are already doing it and you can figure out what you're doing with it, what are, what are some of the reasons why you wouldn't just stick with this uh, style of architecture? Um, efficient scaling. If your uh, web server is one big uh, system that handles, like if you hit your www address and every single page on that's being ha handled by the exact same uh, web server, you end up in a situation, if you want to scale one portion of it, you have to scale the whole thing. You ha um, at the Texas Tribune, we have a, a, a particular use case where this is a problem for us. Um, we do a lot of big uh, uh, data explorers. Uh, since we cover uh, politics and policy as a paper, we'll get uh, government data and then uh, come up with a way to format it so you can understand it, create some visualizations around it, and kind of tell a story around it. Um, we have a database of all of the, uh, the people who have contributed and received money for uh, political contributions in the state of Texas for the last decade. Um, it's a few million people. Um, Whenever we update that and publicize that we've updated, we've got new data, uh, when we initially launched it, we have these huge spikes. There's a lot of traffic on the site around that one portion of the site. Um, if it's part of our WWW project, when we go to scale that, we're also scaling all of our story infrastructure. We're also scaling all of our video infrastructure. We're also scaling all of our uh, image galleries and things like that. If everything's lumped into one big project, to scale any one part of it, you scale the whole thing. Um, but when we talk about scaling, we normally talk about scaling up. One of the other things you can do is scale it down. So our life cycle looks like a reverse hockey stick. So we have this immediate, immense amount of traffic. We go from zero to thousands of people, tens of thousands of people on a particular page or in a particular area of our site. It stays up there for a day or two, and then it kind of goes down, and by the end of the week, it's back down to next to no traffic. Um, and that's sort of the maintenance mode for us on most of our applications. And then as more people start referencing it and it, it gets indexed by Google and more people start finding it organically, it starts to slowly creep back up. Um, once we get through that initial burst, though, we don't need that many workers uh, able to handle all of that. But when we're talking thousands of users on the site at a time versus five or ten at any given time, those are two totally different uh, uh, levels that we need to be able to handle. By, allowing, by creating something that you can scale stuff back down and independently, um, you can get really creative in your server infrastructure and probably save some money. Um, we're starting to do more and more hosting on Heroku, and that means we can get away with a, a simple one or two dyno system. So uh, a, a part of our site that has millions of pages, uh, we can run for $25 a month plus the database. Um, so think about scaling, not only in terms of scaling up, but also how can you scale it back down when you don't need it. For most people, this is even just sort of the, the daily flux of people not accessing the site uh, through the night and then going back up. Uh, but you might have a section of your site that's really popular during evening uh, um, TV. And if that's the case, you need to be able to scale that up but scale that up independently on a different schedule than everything else. Um, the other really big problem with this is that you have one application server. It's still uh, a single point of failure. Um, when everything is all related and it's all running in the same space, you end up in a situation where if your uh, image gallery code caused a problem and started taking a site down, that could take down everything else, even if it's completely unrelated. So when you're thinking about this, 
and thinking about the, the architecture, having that, that single one big application server, it's really easy to approach. You want to run the site, go grab this code, start it up, and you're done. Uh, but it does introduce a, a single point of failure. Um, and that doesn't really even address this. So one of the biggest problems we have right now is that, that yes, we still like to think of the mobile web. We still like to think of, of the desktop web, the classic web. There's these two different things. Um, but we're entering a, a multi-device world um, where it's your, your toaster, it's your TV, um, it's your tablet, it's your in-car navigation system. I can't wait until I can get tweets like going across a ticker on the top of my uh, car or the, the little heads-up display in my car. That'd be amazing. And I'm sure there's going to be a ton of accidents when that happens. Oh, they said, what? Um, but as we enter this, this, this world where we're not sure what's going to be here in another few years, we need to be thinking about how do we serve that content. And if all of the stuff that's in your application right now is tied up behind a server that's generating HTML uh, and s sending all the HTML and JavaScript back to the client, well, that's not going to work on a bandwidth const constricted device like something talking over 3G uh, and displaying stuff in your car. Um, so. What are, why don't I have solutions? I think this should be plural, because I think I just have one general solution here. Um, when you're building your stuff, you want to build things that are small, that are simple, like really easy to understand, and that work together to do something bigger and broader. Um, how many people here are familiar with the Unix philosophy? Okay, so like 10% of the room. Okay. So if you're familiar with the Unix philosophy, you might recognize that as a, a really, really pithy version of describing it. Um, here's the full text. You want to write programs that do one thing and do it well, write programs that work together, and write programs that handle text streams because that's the universal interface. Um, how many people in here use Linux at, on servers or desktop or anything? Okay. How many people here have piped to more than have written a one, one line of bash that's piped to more than five processes. Okay, four processes. Okay, everybody keep your hands up. Three processes, two processes, like you've had one process and piped it into one other thing. Okay, so about two-thirds of the people. So one of the things that you can do with the Linux that makes it so cool, or any Unix-style system, is the ability to take the output from one thing, pipe it into another thing, and have it do something else with it. So like you, you've got a, a list of columns and you want to swap the order, uh, cat those, the text of those columns, and use, I guess you could use awk, you could use cut, you could use a couple of different things to take that and flip the order of them around so that they come out in a different way. Um, and then you could run that through sort, and then once you've got them all sorted, then you could look at the uniques. Like, it just goes on and on and on and on of the things you can do. Um, but that's because one of the early philosophies in the Unix style of programming was that each one of those particular tools would do one very specific thing. They would take some, some sort of information, they would do some sort of processing on it and generate some additional information. So if you take this and you cut out a few particular words here, a few keywords, and you replace them with web services, and I've got JSON data in there. I need to put a question mark by it. But if you, you can apply this to the web and how you should be developing your server architecture. So you want to write web services that do one thing and do it well. Write web services that work well together and then write web services that handle JSON. It should be just data, because it could be JSON, it could be XML, it could be, it could be HTML for that matter, and you're treating it like some sort of XML markup. Um, but you need to do these, these uh, programs that are comprised of a bunch of really small, simple things. So what's that look like? Um, this is the old style. This is sort of a zoom in. If you, could, if you go back to the old slides, or the other slides that I had up, um, everything had a... Uh, uh, the little application server box. This is like a zoom in of that. So a pretty simple thing here. You have your user authentication. Your sessions are going to be in there. Any sort of content that you've got. I've got kind of like, should have like an asterisk spider or a star. The random models, just random things you've got in your database that you've got a representation of that you can, can uh, pull out. But they're all inside your application server. So your user code is able to talk to the sessions because it's just right there. 
um, your session code can go do things like look up some random data and stick it in the session so that it's there on the next request. Um, your content can, can know whether or not the user is authenticated and possibly put uh, update an array that's in the session that says this is content that they've seen. Um, but all these things are all executing together in one big container. Um, this is the new style um, in a very, very, very simplified way of looking at it. So up at the top of the, this cluster, you have your application server. You have something, uh, and it's then talking to all these different services that all exist possibly on the same machine in just different processes, possibly just different code segmented off into different areas. Um, any one of those could be anywhere, but there's just an interface to get, get at them. Um, I say this is simplified because it actually looks a little bit more like this. You got arrows going in every which direction. So your user authentication needs to be able to talk to sessions. Uh, so does content because it wants to know, uh, have they, have a, the, has the user seen this or not? Um, and sessions might actually want to query content to say, well, I know that there was, the session has this information in it, but I want to see if there was anything new uh, so that I can go ahead and have that. Uh, random models might be throwing stuff into the session uh, to say this user hasn't seen this, there's this new content that they need to know about. Um, so it's kind of these arrows going in all which directions. Um, you end up with this application server sort of becoming a, a glue layer on top of everything. Um, the term glue I'm using very particularly here. Uh, if you go back into the history of PHP, it started out as a glue language. Its entire purpose was to build stuff that looked an awful lot like this. Um, and when you hear the, the term used spaghetti code. This is kind of the stuff they're talking about. It's poorly written and it's not really easy to understand and it's become a derogatory thing. But a lot of different things linking to other things. PHP always sat in the middle of that, bringing together your web server that could actually handle queuing up requests and making it able to communicate with a cache backend and a database server or multiple database servers pro pro uh, possibly. Um, it would be able to talk to a search index and handle uh, doing all those queries and bringing all this back together to assemble a big thing. It served as the glue around all these other services that handled things like data persistence for you. Um, as PHP has evolved and as other languages have gained popularity in the web space, um, it started to move away from that a little bit. Um, and it, you see these bigger frameworks. You th see things like Cake and Symphony coming up where they're trying to be an all-encompassing framework. And they do a good job of it. Um, Zen framework, same thing. It's doing a good job of giving you a representation of all of this, uh, these different programming ideas, but it becomes a much bigger project rather than sort of just kind of piecing things together. So in order to do anything like this and for people to be able to talk about it other than just coming up with trying to explain what it is they're doing, we need to come up with a name for it. Um, I titled this talk Modern HTTP Architecture. An earlier version of it was called Modern Web Architecture. Um, that's kind of a lie to get all of you guys in here. Because I could give it the name of what I've actually described. Some of you may already have figured this out. Um, but it's something that's been around for a while. Uh, this is service-oriented architecture, um, or uh, SOA. Um, there's big, thick books on this that are, uh, have been around for a decade or longer. If I called this a SOA talk, how many of you would have not come? Um, <laughs> I got, there's a bunch of hands coming up. Um, that's because it's enterprise ready. When you think of SOA, you think of uh, I, the first big book explaining it was uh, a Microsoft press book that was like that thick. It was like a small dictionary. Um, a lot of people have completely ignored it over the last decade because, oh, that's enterprise code. Oh, that's, that's the kind of code I don't need to worry about. I don't do that. I do web stuff. Um, enterprise has gotten a bad rap in the same way that Java has gotten a bad rap and in the same way PHP has a bad rap with a lot of uh, communities. There's a lot of bad Java. There's a lot of bad PHP. There's a lot of bad Python. There's a lot of bad JavaScript. Um, there's a lot of bad enterprise code as well. Um, a lot of people hear that term and they think it's just, oh, these are just people coding so that they have job security and can work at the same job for the next 20 years. 
Well, no, enterprise code is something that's meant to, it's code that's going to run continually for a decade or more. It's bank software. It's things like that. You have to really think about this because you can't just go upgrade your bank and say, there's going to be 30 minutes of downtime this uh, weekend while we take the ATMs down. No, nope, not going to work. Uh, so you have to think through all of these things and figure out how you can, can make your code resilient. Um, and one of the things that came out of this is a service-oriented uh, um, architecture. So don't be afraid of this because it's enterprise. There is actually some, some good payoffs um, in the end. Um, you're already using this, though. That's the thing. Um, just by virtue of doing a web application, um, I'm, I guarantee you that everyone in here is doing parts of this. Um, how many of you have coded your own database, whether you used it in production or not? Got one, two, three, four, okay, there you go, five or six of them, okay. How many of you guys have, have programmed your own cache server? I actually did this once just for fun. I never used it. Uh, I was learning Erlang, and I was like, wow, I could write a cache server that'd be really fast, and I did. And then I was like, whoa, if I put this in production, it'd be great, I have my own cache server. But then I would be responsible for all of it. No, <laughs> run away. Um, so those things are services that you're consuming. You, you have your cache sitting in Redis or memcached. Um, that's a service that you're consuming and you're interacting with. Um, you have your database in MySQL or Postgres. Um, and you're interacting with it through an, an API. Um, start thinking about the way you do your code that way. Um, when you get back into work this next week, dig through your code and, and look at it and say, is there something here that can exist entirely independent of, of the rest of the code base? And I could just create an API around it. Um, you probably have big sections of this in your code already, areas where there's a very defined API and then a bunch of private stuff that's just used internally, but you only access that portion of your code through the coding API. You're getting really close to a service-oriented architecture at that point. It's just the interface, instead of being the network, is now your programming language. Um, let's start looking for these types of things. Um, benefits. One of the fun ones, and this is, this is easier said than done, uh, is the ability to replace uh, pieces of, of your system at will. Um, how many people here use an ORM uh, for dealing with uh, the database? Okay. How many people here have heard at some point in time, oh, you can just swap out databases and it'll just work? How many people has that actually just worked for every time? Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> Um, so there will always be little edge cases. If you're really strict about it, you can, you can do this. Um, but if you're replacing out your user system uh, with a different user system, even if the API is the same, there's going to be little quirks, something that was an undocumented feature that you don't, didn't realize. Um, testing actually helps you a lot with this. Um, if as part of your test suite you actually build out a testing harness that tests all of the public APIs and all of the permutations of it, uh, that you want to support, and then you only use those things in, in your code, or you go in and if there's something that's not quite documented, right, but well, it does this, it has a side effect, go ahead, write the test for it, and then use it, you'd have an early warning system and a way to verify that you could upgrade. Um, but it, it is one of those things, it's, it's a, a better promise than, uh, than actually happens in a lot of cases. Um, one of the big benefits of this is it allows you to use the right tool for the job, depending on what it is you're, uh, you're trying to do. Um, how many people here push to GitHub on a nearly daily basis? Okay, everybody here has a GitHub account, uses GitHub. Um, you know the big download link up on the top? You can go download code. Um, you can do that for any commit on any repository across GitHub. Take a commit ID and pass that 40 character SHA-1 hash to it, and it'll let you download a zip and a tarball for every, every single commit of code across the entirety of GitHub. That has to be in the hundreds of millions, if not billions, of possible downloads um, for reasons that are pretty obvious. They don't want to generate all those and just leave them sitting somewhere because they got to pay the storage bill on that. So they generate them on the fly. Um, they're a Rails shop. Uh, Rails, Ruby, but they have a whole bunch of things in their stack. And the thing that deals with um, their downloads is Node. 
Um, if you ever pay attention to the URL you get redirected to when you do a download, I think it still is nodeload.github.com. Um, they have a node server that they've written that will say, okay, this request has come in. Does this file exist? Oh, it exists. Serve it back. Oh, it doesn't. Well, let me kick off the process that goes and builds it. And that process has to deal with file I.O. and there's network I.O. back and forth. Um, Node is really good at that situation where it's kind of working as an intermediary and can say, oh, I'm not doing anything right now. I'm waiting on a network connection to re return back. So I can go ahead and process other things and I'll queue those up as they come in. Um, it's actually a really good tool for this because downloading, create, generating these downloads is entirely uh, I.O. bound. Um, it's waiting for the, the, the tarball to be generated if it's not already cached. So even though they're a predominantly Ruby shop, um, they were able to to put in Node where it made sense here. Um, the same applies to your code. If you have something that, that's I.O. bound that Node would work great with, okay, there you go. Um, if you have a section, if there's already a pre-existing tool written in another language that you want to use, um, or written in a framework that you don't want to have on the main stack, um, you can put it over and segment it and then have use that as uh, a service rather than having to, to figure out how to integrate it or worse, uh, rewriting it yourself. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, scaling services independently. Uh, I can't talk about this one enough um, because if you think about all of the various pieces of your site um, and how you can scale them all up and down, um, you can drastically reduce your, uh, your server uh, fees, especially if you can host on a cloud provider that gives you some level of, uh, of service uh, for free or a very small, uh, small cost. Um, I know some guys that are serving parts of their infrastructure on like five micros at, uh, on Amazon on AD, uh, AWS. They're, they're basically free for them, and what they're doing is not very CPU intensive. They just need a little bit of memory, uh, so it works great for them. Um, well, implementatio details. <laughs> um, this is not as easy. Uh, this is going to be a lot more work. I don't want to get up here and say, oh, your life's going to be great. Um, it, it, there's a reason enterprise software is as complex as it is. They're dealing with a lot of stuff. Um, and when you start dealing with all of these separate services, the more you add in, the more complex it gets. It's just like when you start programming and doing stuff for the web, you just have HTML. And you're like, well, I need to store this somewhere. Well, let's bring a database in. You get your database in. Then you need to bring a caching server in. And then you're like, well, there's this other data that I could pre-populate into a cache. And then I've got my session cache that I need to have. So those are two different types of cache. And before you know it, you're running a system that has 20 or 30 different services behind it, and you've got a much more complex thing than just serving a simple web page. Um, same thing here. Uh, as you start breaking off parts of your site um, or parts of your application, you're going to end up in the same situation where it's a bunch of things working together. This comes back to the small, simple programs uh, that do one thing and focus on that. Um, if you can look at any one element of the site, uh, or the system and understand what's going on there and then step up to the things that consume that and understand what they do just by themselves and every one of the layers has that. Uh, it's really easy to approach this, but it does take more time uh, and uh, um, more planning. Uh, this is the big one. Uh, it's just like doing uh, interface-driven design, uh, which is a big thing that was popular a half decade ago in Java, where you wouldn't write any code. You would just sit down and write the interfaces for everything. Um, and then people could say, oh, I implement this interface and you're, you're, uh, everything's good. But in order to think of all of those use cases without actual running code, uh, you have to plan a little bit more. So if you're refactoring an existing system, uh, you sort of have the broader use cases. You still need to plan out how to distribute them. Uh, if you're doing a greenfield project, this can be a little bit more uh, daunting, especially on that first attempt. Um, refactoring this type of code uh, is non-trivial. Um, you can end up in a situation where a simple change over here has ripple effects. This is the same problem you have in your code once your code base gets big enough. Um, it's just you might have different teams or different people working on different services, and they might change something, and it has side effects that you just didn't realize. Um, this comes back to uh, really good test coverage of your APIs. Um, if you can do that, you always have something to say, wait, you broke this, and look, you even broke the build. Why did you even commit that? Um, or, I made this amazing change that just did everything and made our system much better. We're running on half the number of servers, um, and response times are down to 10 milliseconds. Um, and I know it's going to work when we deploy this, because look at all these tests that pass. Um, so I've been talking about web services and things like that. If you're doing stuff for the web, you still need to deal with um, HTML. Um, 
I'm proposing a new uh, as a service term. Um, I'm going to get has or has um, HTML as a service. Uh, when you start thinking about the services that your system provides, um, whether it's a session or a user system or even the HTML on the page, you can identify a discrete service. Um, there is a layer in your system that takes content or data and turns it into HTML. Um, it would actually look a bit like this. This is our diagram from earlier, but the application uh, server up at the top is now just an HTML service. Um, it would take and communicate between all the different APIs that it needs and uh, be able to generate the HTML to serve back. The benefit of something like this is if you're doing a web app that needs to be searchable, but you want to uh, be able to take advantage of transition, like in-page transitions, um, or you want to do other interesting things, or make a, a full app container out of it, but you still need to or want to support older browsers or browsers that aren't as smart, you don't have to worry about that in your API or inside your individual apps. They just return data, and then you have this layer that your router can talk to that can generate the HTML. Um, and with some of the new templating languages that are out there, uh, Mustache.js, uh, I believe there's a Handlebars one as well, um, that can render on the server and on the client, all of a sudden you can share your templating code between those two, um, and now you're treating it just as a service. This means when you do your iOS or your Android app or your Firefox OS app, um, you don't have to worry about reinventing the wheel everywhere. If you need to do a native iOS app or a native Android app, just talk to the service for the content you need, grab the raw data, and use that rather than trying to figure out, okay, well, I've got this HTML representation, how do I pull that out? Um, if you treat HTML as just one, one of the services and generating a, uh, a static HTML page um, is the thing that, uh, that you need to do, or that, that service does, you have a really simple thing that ties it all together. Um, and you still have a really good API elsewhere because now you've had to use your APIs from these various services to generate that page. So you know the second you start working on a native app and on a particular platform, you already have everything you need. That's the big thing I've found with some of the native uh, apps I've worked on. Uh, you get down, you have an existing body of content that you want to uh, have access to in a native app, and then you're like, oh, well, I need an API for that. And, oh, well, I need an API for that. Oh, well, what about this and that other thing? Um, and before you know it, you're spending all of your time generating APIs because all of your code, all of your data was locked up in this big st single stack, um, and you never really thought about the API outside of the API you have in, uh, into your programming language to it. Um, I said this isn't going to be a cookbook uh, style talk. There are two things I want to call out, and they've b both got some uh, some play uh, here at the conference. I believe there was a talk earlier about this. Um, Nginx and uh, Varnish. These are two uh, reverse proxy tools. Um, the first, Nginx, is really good at reverse proxying. Um, and does an okay job at caching. Um, Varnish is really good at caching and does an okay job at uh, reverse proxying. Um, you can combine them. There's nothing saying you can't. I, we actually run what we call an Nginx sandwich, where we have SSL terminating to Nginx because Varnish can't deal with that. Um, then it talks to Varnish, which handles all of our caching, and then that dispatches out to an another Nginx layer, which handles fanning out the request across all of our app servers. Um, so we're using Nginx in two capacities, one for SSL termination and uh, two for reverse proxying, and then Varnish as our caching layer. Um, both of these tools, as you start building out services, can help, uh, help you do that, both from the reverse proxying to sort of get things fanned out to the correct places, um, and also from the caching standpoint. Um, so I highly recommend checking out both of these. Um, there's one thing I want to call out for further reading. Uh, there's a site called 12factor.net. Um, it was written by the guys over at Heroku. Um, if you haven't read this, um, it probably takes 30 minutes to an hour or so to go through and read everything. Um, but it's a, a 12 different uh, steps or factors in what they say is a good, uh, well-factored uh, application that's meant to run on the cloud. Um, the the same principles apply uh, when you're dealing with service-oriented architecture, whether you're running it on something like Heroku or spinning up your own cloud cluster on Rackspace or uh, Amazon, um, or using your own hardware. A lot of the same principles apply. Uh, so if, if you follow that, you'll end up uh, uh, having code that, that, looks, that, that works really well with service-oriented architecture. Um, so that's the, what I have for this talk. Um, I hope that you guys uh, will start thinking about your, 
uh, your web application, instead of just the web application, start thinking about it about the pieces of your web application and how much you'll be able to segment those off. Uh, for a lot of us, um, for a long time at the Texas Tribune, that was definitely premature optimization to start segmenting all of those pieces off. Um, we're getting to the point right now where we're seriously considering uh, supporting native applications on multiple devices in different contexts. Um, and having this style of architecture allows us to do that more easily. It also allows us to save some money uh, in our hosting so that our hosting build kind of stays flat instead of that just continual rise. Um, so we can be a little bit more efficient. Um, as more and more devices come online and more and more native applications happen, I think you're going to see this as something that we have to do. Um, and you'll start to see frameworks that are built around supporting this type of development. Um, this is very, very early stages of this type of development in the web space, short of the enterprise level web. The guys that are doing the financial stuff have been doing things like this for a decade or more. Um, but for the more consumer facing stuff, the things we're doing, um, it's something that, that's, that's just starting to take root. Um, I'm, I've seen talks ab about this uh, by people at, at design conferences, at business conferences, uh, and at development conferences. Uh, so I think everybody's kind of converging on this. Um, and there's a lot of people looking out there at the list of just Android versions that they have to support and devices that they have to support and going, how do I do this? Um, well, as far as getting the content onto those devices, um, this is one way, one of the things that you can uh, definitely do with that. So with that, um, there's the link to the, uh, the talk. Uh, it's up on GitHub. Um, there's a few little changes in here that still need to be committed and pushed, but they'll be up this afternoon. Um, again, I'm T. Swice, good just about everywhere. Uh, thank you. <laughs>